on behalf of the Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement and the Water Policy Center, of course. It gives me a great pleasure to extend a warm welcome to our distinguished speakers, chair, and participants who have joined this session. To chair this session, we have Professor Sumit Ganguly with us today. It is my great pleasure to introduce the chair. Professor Sumit Ganguly is a distinguished professor of political science and holds the Ravindranath Tagore chair in the Indian Cultures and Civilizations at Indiana University, Bloomington, USA. Professor Ganguly has previously taught at James Madison College of Michigan State University, Hunter College, and the Graduate Center of the City's University of New York and the University of Texas at Austin. He has been a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C., a visiting fellow at the Center for International Security and Cooperation at the Center on Democracy, Development and the Rule of Law at Stanford University, a guest scholar at the Center for Cooperative Monitoring in Albuquerque, and a visiting scholar at the German Institute of International and Area Studies in Hamburg. He has also held the Asia Chair at Sciences Po in Paris and the NG and Chair in International Politics at the Rajan, Rajatnam uh, School for International Studies at Nangyang Te Technological University in Singapore. In 2017-2018, he was a visiting professor at the Strategic Studies Institute of the U.S. Army War College. He will spend the summer of 2018 as an Alexander von Humboldt Fellow at the University of Heidelberg. Professor Kangali is a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He is an associate editor of International Security and serves on the editorial boards of the Asian Security, Current History, the Journal of Democracy, Foreign Policy Analysis, the India Review, the Non-Proliferation -prof uh, Review, Pacific Affairs, and Security Studies. He is currently at work on a book that focuses on the origins and evolution of India's defense policy for Columbia University Press. Without extending further, let me request Professor Sumit Ganguly to take charge of the session. Thank you very much for that overly long and uh, overly generous introduction. Um, uh, just for the record, this year, I, uh, because my term ran out, I finally stepped down as associate editor of both security studies and international security. So that's just a little update, but that's because they have term limits and you can only serve for so long. Um, Without any um, further ado, uh, we will get started. And I'm delighted that uh, people were willing to accommodate the time in the United States because it's early evening already in India. Um, and I suspect very early in the morning in Hawaii. In fact, Indeed. that's some ungodly <laughs> hour uh, in Hawaii. Uh, 2.15, so, 2.30, yeah. Oh, good God. This is above and beyond the call of duty. Um, uh, I do not seem to have the roster in front of me. So Pramod, who are we supposed to begin with? Uh, sir, we can start with uh, Ambassador Asuk Sazanhar. Okay. Um, Ambassador, uh, would you please uh, start, uh, start us off with your uh, presentation in that event? Thank you very much uh, for not, gracing this occasion. Not at all. Thank you very much, Professor Ganguly, uh, for being here and uh, fellow panelists and uh, participants. Uh, let me first of all uh, thank uh, and congratulate uh, Dr. Pramod Jaiswal, NICE, and also WPC for putting this uh, together. Uh, as I was mentioning to him, this really seems to be the Mahakumb of uh, international relations because it is spreading over such a long period in terms of duration and also in terms of the number of issues that are being discussed. But I particularly commend him because uh, 
for selecting this uh, subject, this issue uh, of uh, discussing uh, matters related to COVID-19 and what is going to happen in the post-pandemic order as and when it arrives, because uh, there is so much of uncertainty, there's so much of uh, confusion, and there are looming clouds of conflict and contestation that are hovering all around us. Uh, we see that there is intense uh, global rivalry and deep distrust and lack of understanding among several major players in the world. So I, what, uh, uh, during this conference, at least over the last two days, we have heard uh, very many different perspectives as far as COVID-19 is concerned. Uh, I'm going to be focusing on uh, COVID-19 and uh, uh, multilateralism. Uh, and uh, over the next uh, 10 minutes or so that I have, I will uh, consider whether multilateralism or uh, uh, has it uh, uh, been successful, uh, or even if we were to break uh, multilateralism into regionalism or plurilateral organizations, how have they acquitted themselves? If uh, they have not uh, been uh, very successful, what is the reason? And going forward, what can be done to uh, set, uh, set it right? So uh, I would imagine if you were to look at to the response to the first question is that multilateral and regional bodies have fallen far short of expectations. Before looking at that, uh, let us see what has been the state of multilateral institutions in the pre-COVID period. Again, we would say not very good. Uh, we have been speaking for several decades, in fact, about reforms of the United Nations Security Council, that it does not reflect uh, the reality of the world today. It is anachronistic to have five countries as permanent members with veto power. The world today is very different, not only in terms of membership of the United Nations, because when uh, the UN took off, when it was established in 1945, it had 51 members and now it has 193 members. But also in terms of uh, distribution of uh, power, of uh, relevance, significance, influence amongst the different uh, players, that has undergone a huge change. Uh, we have been speaking about uh, changing in the working procedures of uh, the United Nations, as well as its agencies, the reform of the General Assembly uh, and of uh, many of its uh, uh, constituent uh, parts of the United Nations. So it has not been a perfect uh, system. And uh, then, uh, of course, it was also dealt, uh, uh, sorry, it was also dealt uh, My video seems to have stopped somehow. We can hear you just fine. Yeah, you can hear me. So I'm, I'm just trying to set my video if it can work out, but if it doesn't. Yes, you can be seen, sir. Okay. So uh, we have also uh, seen in terms of uh, the assumption of office by President uh, Donald Trump that he has not helped uh, matters. He, uh, right after coming to office, he withdrew from the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Of course, TPP is not uh, either a UN uh, uh, agreement or otherwise related to the UN, but it's some sort of a plurilateral uh, accord that had been established uh, uh, before his arrival. He withdrew from the Climate Change Accord he uh, withdrew also from the Iranian nuclear deal. All of them were uh, blessed by the United Nations, so to say. But uh, these uh, deficiencies notwithstanding, uh, we have seen that whenever a crisis has appeared on the scene, the multilateral system has uh, risen up to the task. Let me provide uh, you with two examples. The first is in terms of the uh, of uh, the pandemic Ebola, which was uh, 2014, six years ago. The public health emergency of international concern, 
when uh, that was announced by the WHO, immediately the, secure, the UN Security Council got together and uh, declared, uh, announced that this was a matter of uh, uh, a threat to global peace and security. It asked all the constituent countries, all the members' countries, to do all that they could to deal with it. Now compare this with what has happened in the current context. In the current context, uh, in the month of March, when uh, the pandemic was raging at its worst, just on the, on the 31st of January, if my memory serves me correctly, it had been declared as the public health uh, emergency international concern. I think on the 11th of March, it was declared as a pandemic. But uh, no meeting took place in uh, the month of March 2020 because the chair at that time, China, it said that uh, this issue goes beyond the mandate of the Security Council because uh, it is a matter of health. It does not relate to peace and security in the world. So no meeting of the UN Security Council could take place in March. It took place only in April when the chairmanship of uh, the UN Security Council changed to Dominican Republic. Incidentally, in March, when uh, China said that it does not uh, include, it does not, uh, uh, the mandate of the Security Council doesn't extend to dealing with issues like uh, the uh, coronavirus pandemic. It was supported in this by Russia and uh, a permanent member and a non-permanent member, South Africa. This is just for information. But uh, the meeting took place in, uh, of the UN Security Council in uh, April when Dominican Republic became the president on the 9th of uh, April. But there also nothing much uh, could really happen because there was uh, too much of uh, tussle between uh, the United States and between uh, China because uh, uh, China did not wish to mention what was the origin of uh, uh, this uh, of this uh, virus. So uh, today, when we see that uh, the total number of uh, uh, those affected is in the range of about 25 million, those who have died is in the range of about 850,000. Still, there is no resolution emanating from the UN Security Council on this issue. The other uh, example that I would uh, submit for your consideration is that of the economic crisis in 2008-2009. At that time, we know we had the G8 uh, uh, grouping uh, that uh, was uh, on the scene, and that was very quickly expanded to G20. And uh, G20 decided that $1 trillion should be allocated, should be assigned to the IMF and to the World Bank to take care of the problems, particularly as far as the developing countries are concerned. Nothing of this nature has uh, taken place this time, although the G20 met once on the 26th of March uh, at the prodding, at the instance of uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, Modi. But uh, not much of a decision could be taken except that uh, the WHO needs to be strengthened, that the uh, debts of the developing countries, they need to be waived off. But there was no package of the nature that we were able to put together in uh, 2009. And I think the magnitude of the problem today being such that we really need uh, something like two and a half trillion dollars, if not more, to uh, provide to all the countries. I think more than 100 countries have approached the IMF and the World Bank for assistance and for uh, debt relief. Uh, of course, the uh, UN uh, Secretary General could also set up a body, could take an initiative in this direction, but he has also not uh, been forthcoming. The World Bank and IMF have come out with reports to suggest that uh, the global economy will go down by about 5% or so. Different countries are going to contract at different rates. The United States at about minus 8%, but uh, these, these are... Uh, now, horrifying figures. Uh, these are the sort of figures we have not uh, seen or heard uh, since the economic depression about uh, uh, close to a century ago. But still, as far as the multilateral system is concerned, that has uh, not uh, been operational. If you look at the World Health Organization again, 
its uh, credibility has been severely Im uh, impaired. The Director General of uh, WHO has been uh, seen or is being cons has been considered to collude and be complicit with China in uh, uh, misleading the world about the origin and nature of the virus. If, uh, of course, this is the uh, definite feeling around the world that if uh, China had come out honestly and openly, we would not have been in these uh, dire straits as we find ourselves. If it had not allowed millions to leave uh, Wuhan around the middle of January, in the third week of January, and uh, spread uh, out over the world, uh, we would not be staring at such a catastrophe. So in addition to the uh, multilateral system as such, global leadership also has failed. Uh, we know that earlier, whether it was in the case of Ebola or it was in the case of the 2008 economic uh, financial crisis, it was the United States which took the leadership. As I mentioned, at this moment, the United States has uh, stepped backward. It's become more isolationist. It's become uh, more uh, uh, individualistic, not interested in leading the world. And uh, China, which has uh, pretensions, but it has been totally exposed uh, by its behavior at the beginning of the pandemic, not coming out openly, by its uh, wolf warrior uh, diplomacy, by its uh, hubris by its uh, weaponization of its medicines and medical equipment like ventilators and face masks and by supply uh, to several countries of uh, substandard and inferior quality medicines and medical supplies. Of course, it will be pert pertinent here to mention that uh, uh, women leaders of the world have proved themselves to be comparatively more competent and effective in dealing with the crisis. Whether it is uh, Jacinda Ardern in uh, New Zealand, whether it is uh, Angela Merkel in Germany, or uh, Tsai Ing-wen in Taiwan, uh, Erna Solberg in uh, Norway, or Mette Fredriksson in Denmark, all of them have been able to move forward with a style which, is, uh, which has been consensual, which has been inclusive, non-hierarchical, consultative, and communicative. Uh, I would imagine that uh, this uh, uh, styles open, transparent, and honest, these are the qualities of leadership we also need at the global level. Unfortunately, with the two of the pretenders, the United States and China, they do not fit the bill. So going forward, it appears that there could be a concert of middle powers which, which could provide leadership to the world in rule setting and in governance. My final point is uh, in terms of what do we do as uh, we go ahead? What are the challenges confronting the world and the multilateral system? Number one, we need to ensure that there is no repetition of a similar pandemic. We need to strengthen the World Health Organization, the provisions of its reporting of a pandemic. I remember distinctly in 2018, when the Nipah virus was uh, isolated in Kerala in India, on the second day, the communication went to the WHO and we were able to, uh, to uh, combat, confront and deal with that virus within a couple of weeks. Unfortunately, China's track record has not been very, uh, uh, very bright in this regard. So whether it is the coronavirus now, or it is the bird flu in 2017, it is the SARS uh, in 2002, it is the Hong Kong flu in the 1968, the bird flu in 1996, all these uh, viruses have emanated from the wet markets of China. So I think going forward, we need to see how the reporting mechanisms can be improved, can be made better. The second challenge would be in terms of uh, the, uh, or the uh, work that is being done on uh, developing the vaccine or the cure for the coronavirus. 
uh, there is uh, the world's best minds and the best funding is going into this. And what we need to do is uh, that we need to ensure that there is multilateral cooperation and coordination. India can, of course, play a very significant role in this. India has uh, emerged as uh, the pharmacy of the world, even during this period, it has supplied uh, medicines, uh, whether as grant or uh, on commercial terms to more than 150 countries, different types of uh, medication. And uh, particularly important would be to reach out to poorer and developing countries because it is uh, the poorer countries and even in those countries, those at the bottom of the rung who the dispossessed people who would be the least to and the last to get the benefits. So I think what we really need to do is to ensure that this crisis does not uh, go to waste, that we transform this crisis into an opportunity. And my last word would be that India has uh, so far equated itself uh, uh, reasonably creditably, no, notwithstanding the fact uh, that the numbers every day are increasing. But in, just in terms of numbers, the uh, recovery rate is more than 75%. And the fatality rate is uh, the lowest uh, in the world, just about 2% or so. So uh, India has been following the policy of Vasudhev uh, Kutumbakam, which means the whole world is a family. Its position as the chair of the World Health Assembly for this year, its position as the member of the UN uh, Security Council, as a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council for the next two years, and as chair of G20 in 2022, provides a prom promising opportunities for promoting cooperation and collaboration in the global community in fighting with this uh, virus and any after effects. Let me stop here, Professor Ganguly, and of course, I'll be happy to take uh, questions and comments as there might be at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you very much for that extraordinarily clear and eloquent presentation. We are off to a marvelous start. Uh, thanks to you. Uh, one could not have expected a better overview of the state of multilateral cooperation, or frankly, the lack thereof, and the complete abnegation of responsibility on the part of the United States and uh, the People's Republic of China, and the complicity of the People's Republic of China in this entire fracas that we find ourselves in. Without any further ado, we will promptly turn to Professor Sham Tekwani of the Daniel Inoue uh, Center, uh, at the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in Hawaii. And I am enormously grateful to you for joining us for what is undoubtedly a truly ungodly hour in Hawaii. Well. Well, thank you, Sumit. Uh, first of all, uh, Pramod, and nice. Thank you very much for uh, this platform uh, to speak. And uh, also, hello to familiar faces, Sumit, Smriti, Raji. Uh, we've all met at some point or the other before. You may or may not remember, but uh, yes. familiar faces. And hello to everybody I'm not familiar with also. All right, so I have uh, 12, 13 minutes, and uh, I'm going to take this opportunity uh, basically to uh, hit the highlights of uh, a paper I wrote, which is going to be coming out in a day or two, I think. Uh, so, uh, and this is looking at uh, terrorism and counterterrorism in the time of COVID. Now, at the outset, I should say, uh, I'm defining the word terrorism rather loosely. I don't want to get down into the weeds trying to debate what is terrorism and what is not. When I, when I speak about terrorism and counterterrorism here for the purpose of the next 12, 13 minutes, I'm including separatist movements, insurgencies, and what have you, simply because uh, uh, it, it, it obviates the need to, to, to define what terrorism is, number one. And number two, let's face it, more and more governments these days find the label very convenient uh, when they have to deal with even as something inane uh, as political opponents. Uh, so I'll keep the definition a bit uh, wide uh, in this uh, in this context 
So to start off, uh, I also have to offer you the caveat. Uh, I, I, I know there's this uh, slide behind me. I don't know how to get rid of it, uh, but that's the 25th anniversary of the Asia Pacific Center, which we are celebrating in three days from now. Uh, I have to reiterate uh, that what I say are my opinions. They do not reflect the opinions of the United States Department of Defense or the Daniel K. Noe Asia Pacific Center of Security Studies. And these are my opinions here. And I'll try and figure out tomorrow how to remove that uh, slide from my back. Uh, okay. All right. So um, to get to the meat of the matter, uh, every crisis, whether it is man-made or otherwise, offers challenges and more importantly, opportunities. And this is true for both the people who use violence in pursuit of the political goals, as well as those of us in the business of countering terrorism. Okay, so I'll just offer a few observations. Uh, is terrorism increasing during the time of COVID or not? You're gonna hear, if, if you're interested in the topic, you know, you're gonna come across reports offering you both points of view. One, 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 group, one point of view is terrorism is on the uptick because of COVID. COVID has provided the opportunities because governments are busy doing other stuff and they've diverted resources and therefore terrorism is going up. Now, um, let me tell you, uh, I don't see any evidence this far to indicate that COVID has contributed to an increase in terrorism. What we hear and what we read, uh, half of it is half-baked and the other half is very ill-informed. I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, some of the media reports, not just media reports, even scholarly writings uh, coming out, uh, at least from this part of the world, uh, they take an example of terrorism on the up uptick because of COVID, and they often talk about Kashmir. Now, the correlation is terrible simply because these people were writing reports on uh, using uptick in terrorist activity in Kashmir as an illustration of, of that being a, a direct result of COVID, simply do not know that this is seasonal. The snows are melting, people are, the, 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 the insurgents or terrorists are able to move freely. And every year at this point in time, you will always witness uptick. So to, to, to correlate that to COVID is, is bizarre, is absurd. And as I said earlier, so far all the reports that I've seen that I follow that talk about an uptick in terrorism because of COVID, it's, uh, there's no evidence at all. As I said, it's half cooked and half ignorant. So uh, I don't see any evidence. What it's gonna look like after the uh, pandemic is over, it's hard to say. But I think at this point, I will argue that I do not see any evidence to substantiate the argument that COVID has led a rise to attacks and terrorist activity. On the other hand, uh, what is important to know is um, we are seeing, if, if, if people are going to argue that COVID has increased opportunities for terrorists, uh, what we need to see, we can't lose sight of the fact that this also applies to countries and counter-terrorist organized, counter-terrorism organizations. And I'll give examples again here. Um, both, both governments and the bad guys, they are exploiting the environment to, to what they see is their advantage. Now, this could be in the areas of narratives. It's not just ISIS or some uh, a, a clergyman sitting in uh, Islamabad invoking God to proclaim that the virus is divine retribution on non-believers and that it's divine punishment for its enemies. Governments are doing it. You saw the example in India, Corona Jihad. That, that, where did that come from? That came from, 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 from governments. It didn't come from radical groups. So the gov there are governments doing the same. In addition to what I mentioned earlier, perverting legal definitions of terrorism, rewriting anti-terrorism laws, curbing media freedoms to prosecute people who are politically opposed to their uh, policies. Then there's an issue of governance. Um, there's concern that uh, provision of services and aid where terrorists demonstrate their public health capabilities 
and terrorist terror groups are often filling in to step the existing vacuum made by governments. We have seen that historically over the last 30 years. You know, uh, I wouldn't worry too much about it, simply because uh, th this, this, this uh, goodwill that insurgents and groups are able to gain from the local population doesn't last too long. Because at some point, governments do step in and play the role. So I wouldn't take that as something, something that one has to lose sleep about. Okay. Um, uh, and a classic example was when we saw the avalanche in Kashmir uh, uh, about a decade ago. Uh, was it a decade ago or less than a decade ago? Uh, we saw the, the luxury groups jumping in, providing aid. It, it didn't last for too long. Uh, likewise, in, in Sri Lanka during the tsunami, the Tamil Tigers stepped in the eastern part of Sri Lanka. Uh, what, what good did it do to them? Not much. Uh, so yes, they will fill in a role. Uh, they will fill in that vacuum to gain, gain goodwill, but that goodwill doesn't last for too long. The contrary, if you did a broad scan of the Indo-Pacific region, uh, I, I'll come back to this. Most governments are using this opportunity to tighten their grip on their own populations. And one common thread is that the pandemic is providing cover for the war on journalists, civil society organizations. You take India, you take Sri Lanka, you take Philippines. These are three most visible countries doing it. And, and why, why do I keep stressing this? Uh, uh, on the one hand, I'm telling you, we're not seeing an uptick in terrorist activity because of COVID. On the other hand, what I'm trying to caution us all is when governments do this, when they take advantage of this for their own purposes, you are creating an environment which will enable, which will enable insurgency, which will enable terrorism. And don't forget, after COVID, uh, we are all going to be looking at a huge economic downturn and also unemployment. And add to that youth bulge in South Asia, for instance. So you have unemployment, you have poor education access, you have a, a bad economy, and you have angry young people. Uh, what are you going to do with that? How are you going to prepare yourself for that? So that's something I think I would be more worried about than worrying about ISIS or Lakshara Toiba taking advantage of COVID. We haven't seen any attack, the magnitude of uh, the Easter attacks in Sri Lanka or Mumbai attacks or even the bakery attacks in Dhaka. We haven't seen any of that happen during COVID. Neither have we seen uh, something similar in Southeast Asia like what happened in Marawi four or five years ago. We haven't. So I, I, I really don't think we have to worry about those kind of big attacks, but we do have to worry about what governments like, uh, you know, Sri Lanka, militarization of the entire civil uh, government. Uh, India, civil protests are labeled terrorism. People are being picked up just because they protested. Uh, students, um, media, of course, forget media. There's no media in India. Uh, so basically what you're doing is uh, you're also stoking Islamophobia even more greatly. Uh, Pakistan, further militarization. The COVID crisis was taken away from the civilian government's hand and controlled by the military. Malaysia, coronavirus, what did it do? It stroked xenophobia, so xenophobia against the Rohingya refugees. Um, so I would say uh, Bangladesh is a case in point. You had a massive cyclone during COVID. Did the, were any terrorists able to exploit that chaos and conduct another bakery kind of attack? No, it didn't. Uh, I'll come to Thailand. I made a reference earlier to the 2004 tsunami, which uh, resulted actually in a peace pact between the, 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 the separatist group in Aceh, uh, Gam, and Jakarta. Uh, compare that to Thailand in, during COVID. Uh, the Thais took a very different approach. Uh, when the main separatist group, the BRM, they announced a unilateral ceasefire early in April that it suspended hostilities. But what did the Thai military decide to do? They thought this was an opportunity for them to strike. Uh, they struck. And now that whole, uh, that whole effort at even uh, bringing about a semblance of peace is blown sky high. So uh, I think what I want to conclude with, I know I've run out of my 12 minutes, but I want to, what I want to conclude uh, with is there's not so much activity on the terrorist front but there's a great deal of activity 
from the government's side across a few countries I've named, they are, they're most visible. Um, and I think uh, what uh, I would worry about is primarily, what does this mean for us? Uh, is some of the countries will come out of this, uh, at least in the short run, more authoritarian, more polarized, and that equals to instability at, at, in, in the long term. It's going, to, it's going to create instability, political instability. And I spoke about recession. I spoke about unemployment. I spoke about the youth bulge. And so if you see the whole issue in the context where political incentives are aligned towards polarization, incitement, and repression, uh, I think we're looking at greater institutional decay and uncertainty about the future. And that is potentially very volatile and will just provide the right environment for enabling more terrorism in the region. Sumit, I'll end there, uh, and I'm happy to take questions at the end of the session. Thanks very much, particularly for actually adhering uh, to the time limits, contrary to what you said. Uh, you uh, did actually stay within the, uh, the 13, 12, 13 minute limit. And it's a fascinating counterintuitive argument that you're making that contrary to popular belief, terrorism actually hasn't gotten worse in this era of COVID. But then you end on a very cautionary note about what could befall us in the future. And we should all pay heed to this. And particularly, governments need to be alert to the dangers that you have so carefully outlined. Um, and now we turn to Dr. Saturo Nagao, who is a visiting fellow at the Hudson Institute. Thank you very much. I will use the PowerPoint, so I will share uh, Wait. You wanted to share it? Um, so, succeeded? Yes. It's okay. visible. Thank you very much. Yeah, I will start my presentation. So, it is honor for me to make presentation in this big seminar. So title of my presentation is how India, US, Japan, Australia, so so-called Quad Corporation, uh, can strengthen to support Taiwan. I am Japanese who stay in the US think tank. Uh, but uh, I talk about Taiwan and security in the Indo-Pacific today. Because uh, when we think the counter China strategy, Taiwan is mother. So since April 2020, the China has been provoking India, including by the breaching its border. When 20 Indian soldiers were killed in the border crash in June, the Prime Minister Narendra Modi declared that their sacrifice would not be in vain and uh, the Indian government has been stepping up effort to debump its China strategy. These in efforts include reshaping India's relation with Taiwan. So when Taiwan's president Tsai Ing-wen was sworn in for the second time in May 2020, two members of the parliament from India's ruling BJP along with acting director general of the India Taipei Association sent uh, congratulations. So this clearly indicates a new Indian approach. Also in 2040, Taiwan representative to India had attended Prime Minister Modi's uh, swag in ceremony. In 2016, India carefully considered sending a representative to the president's size in adulation, but decide against it. So indeed, it is not only India that is strengthening the relation with Taiwan. The other member of the quadrilateral security dialogue, this means that uh, uh, India, US, Japan, Australia, have also recently upgraded relations.
So today I will explain three topics one by one. So first one is the Taiwan significance for the quadrilateral security dialogue countries. And the second one is uh, why now? And third one is what is the best course of action? The first one. First one is Taiwan significance. There are three. There are at least three reasons why Taiwan is so important to the Quad countries' effort to counter China's strategy. First, Taiwan is located off the coast of China, the core area of Chinese economy, and its strategic location for deterring China's aggression. If Taiwan is collaborating with the United States or Japan to exert military pressure on China's coastal area, then China cannot focus its defense budget or military forces on the India-China border area. So moreover, Taiwan is located between East China Sea and South China Sea. And thus Beijing cannot concentrate its naval forces without going through the sea near Taiwan. Second, Taiwan is an important source of information on China. When the COVID-19 pandemic began, Taiwan proved the worth of the, its knowledge of China, identifying precisely what was happening there in December 2019 and warning the World Health Organization, WHO, of the possibility of pandemic. At the same time, Taiwan was prepared for pandemic and one reason for its great success in addressing the crisis. The same hold true for the military and economic situation. For India, the US and Japan and Australia, Taiwan can be very important source of information about China. Third, cooperation with Taiwan can be effective diplomatic card for the India, US, Japan, Australia to build in the response to China's provocation, which have been escalating. When China, sh China ship, Chinese ship enters the territorial sea around Japan's Senkaku Island, for example, Japan warship could respond with a friendship visit to Taiwanese port. Since China claimed Taiwan as a part of territory, this is the proper response. We haven't done, but we can do. So in addition, because Taiwan is a democratic, it could be a model of the democracy for Chinese speakers. So second, why now? Despite Taiwan's importance, India, US, Japan, Australia might lose Taiwan because Beijing has been stepping up its pressure on Taipei since President Tsai Wen, Tsai Wen took office in 2016. Taiwan is facing diplomatic isolation The COVID-19 crisis has made many countries aware that Taiwan cannot join the international organization like WHO because of the China's opposition. In addition, since June 2017, Panama, Dominican Republic, Burkina Faso, El Salvador, and Solomon Islands on the Kiribati have abandoned formal diplomatic relations with Taiwan as a result of Chinese efforts, including economic assistance and infrastructure projects. This leave only 15 countries with formal diplomatic relation with Taiwan. She is a leader of the President Tsai Wen Ying, uh, Tsai Wen Ying, uh, Tsai Ying Wen, uh, in the uh, when she addressed in the Hudson Institute, current my working place. 
the Chinese government has also tried to diminish her popularity. For example, in two, July 2019, Beijing banned the travel to Taiwan by individuals, causing the number of Chinese travelers to Taiwan to drop by nearly half between 2050 to 2090. So China intend to harm the economy of Taiwan and decline her popularity. And China's rapid military modernization is changing the military balance with Taiwan. China is provoking Taiwan military and its activity on the Pacific side of Taiwan where the Chinese aircraft carrier battle group recently made repeatedly visit are of particular concern. And if Chinese armed force deploys there permanently, this would cut Taiwan off from the US and Japan. So Chinese submarine activity are also cause for concern. Moreover, during the COVID-19 crisis, Chinese fighter jet have repeatedly entered Taiwan's air, airspace. So, what is the best course of action? There are at least three steps we can take. First, we should save the Taiwan from diplomatic isolation. In May 2020, during the COVID-19 pandemic, these countries, we, our, our, uh, yeah, we attempt, ultimately unsuccessful, to support Taiwan's effort to attend the WHO's, WHO's World Health Assembly. Moreover, when the El Salvador, Panama, Dominican Republic, established diplomatic relations with China and dropped Taiwan in 2018. US, United States recalled its ambassadors from these countries. Efforts like these must continue. And the countries that dropped Taiwan in favor of China were interested in Chinese investment. If the Quad countries would collaborate with Taiwan on joint project in the 15 countries that recognize Taiwan. This would be an effective counterweight to China. Four of the, these 15 countries are in the Indo-Pacific countries and are under heavy pressure from China. For example, Chinese tourists were a very important source of income for Palau. But in 2080, China banned its citizens from visiting the Destiny Island, Palau, in order to force Palau to establish diplomatic relations with Beijing and end its relation with Taipei. India, US, Japan, Australia, and Taiwan should collaborate to support countries like Palau. Second, the Quad countries should assist Taiwan in relocating factories from mainland China to other US allies and friendly countries, such as India. Taiwanese factories in China benefit both Taiwan and China, but uh, China can use them as a hostage in order to control Taiwan. Third, the Quad countries should build up Taiwan's defense capabilities. The US has supplied Taiwan with weapons for many years, but because of the China opposition, China's opposition, Washington must address the situation carefully each time and decide whether to proceed with the sale. The best option would be for Taiwan to produce its own weapon and the Quad countries should support this. As an example of Taiwan's effort to produce its own weapons occurred in 2018, 
To respond to China's naval move on the Pacific side of Taiwan, Taipei need to conventional submarine. However, its fleet was obsolete, and the US lacks the technology to de develop new conventional submarines because all US built submarines are nuclear powered. Taiwan decided to start the indigenous submarine project. However, Taiwan lacked the capability to build its own, so had to ask the other countries to assist with the design. As a result, two companies from US and Europe and one from India and Japan are bid for the tender. In this case, Japan's propose, proposal was uh, interesting. The Japanese uh, contractor employed engineers who had worked at submarine manufacturers were now retired. Also, they are not familiar with the latest technologies. Because Japan has a world-class conventional submarine technology, the engineer can design submarines that are sophisticated enough to handle Chinese submarines. So, given the diplomatic hurdle, it is easier to use retired officials. So, India, US, Japan, Australia need to Taiwan to help them respond to China's irresponsible behavior. Now is the time for Quad countries to accept Taiwan as an equal partner and support its efforts. That's my opinion. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Nagao. Uh, that was an extraordinarily clear presentation with a very coherent argument and spelling out uh, the policy options that are available to the Quad to help Taiwan. Uh, it's a fascinating, provocative, and thoughtful presentation, and uh, I'm sure it'll generate questions. Uh, we will turn now to Dr. Um, Rajeshwari Pillay Rajagopalan from the Observer Research Foundation in New Delhi. Uh, thank you, Professor Ganguly, and thank you to the organizers, both the organizations, uh, for inviting me. This is a huge effort uh, spread over three days, a massive effort, and kudos to the organizers for uh, getting us all together. Um, thank you for this opportunity to be part of this, and uh, I will try and focus in my presentation to look at, uh, uh, try and provide an Indian perspective on what the emerging uh, Indo-Pacific strategic order might look like, or at least provide what the Indian goals are in pushing for the strategic order in the region. So the idea of the Indo-Pacific has been gaining ground in the last few years. Uh, of course, uh, the changing balance of power in Asia and beyond uh, does offer uh, immense opportunities for India to take a proactive role in shaping the emerging Indo-Pacific strategic dynamics. Uh, but it calls for New Delhi to have a clearer understanding of the kind of Asia it wants to see and the kind of role it wants to play in this region. Uh, India, for instance, has articulated a couple of different uh, important uh, goals. One, it has said that it wants to see a non-hegemonic Asia, that is, it does not want to see an Asia that is dominated by one single power. Uh, former Foreign Secretary and the current Foreign Minister, Dr. Jay Shankar, has made this point many times and it's amply clear who he's talking to or referring to when he says no hegemonic Asia. Uh, he's clearly referring to China because no other country in the region has really the capacity to dominate the region. A re related articulation is that India would like to see a multipolar world and a multipolar Asia. Um, it is not certain that it is going to lead to a stable Asian strategic order, but this has been sort of the rhetoric that is played in the Indian context and in the Indian debates. A second important uh, goal that India has articulated is that India has stated multiple times that it wants to see a rules-based order. Uh, India has made this emphasis on respect for international law, rules of the road, and this is evidence in its position on some of the regional issues. For instance, on India's position uh, regarding the South China Sea, for instance, is unusually strong considering that it is a dispute distant from Indian shores. Uh, this, is also this also ties in into a concern that India and many of its regional partners have about the increasing likelihood of American inattentiveness in the face of the growing Chinese power. 
Uh, there is greater recognition that China's mounting belligerence requires a regional balancing effort, therefore. This has led India to build closer strategic partnership with countries like Japan, Australia, Singapore, Vietnam, both in terms of security and defense cooperation, and these have become the primary drivers of many of these engagements. These engagements also include growing military exchanges, bilateral as well as multilateral exercises, and even potentially weapon transfers in the future. There is nevertheless a clear recognition that the U.S. is necessarily part of the uh, region, necessarily uh, necessary part of the region security configuration, despite the fact that there is hesitancy or sometimes unwillingness on the part of the U.S. from time to time, or possibly because of it, there is greater willingness on the part of countries like India and its many other partners in the region uh, to shoulder an even bigger responsibility, including military burden, as a way of convincing the U.S. to stay committed in Asia. Uh, in fact, the new region security alignments are in addition to the U.S.-led security arrangements as well as, a, uh, as, well as to supplement to them. Uh, these new alignments and formations are also possibly to circumvent any possible reduction in the presence and the U.S. role uh, of the U.S. role in Asia. But there are several deficiencies in the formulation. The first is the lack of capacity, especially military capacity, on the part of countries like India to carry out effective balancing against China. The second is the absence of willingness to clearly identify the primary motivation for concepts like the Indo-Pacific, for instance, that which is China. And this has to be addressed front and center of our debates. India, as well as many other smaller nations in the uh, region, have resisted from identifying China as the main reason for this new security activism that is seen in the Indo-Pacific. India's own efforts from time and again to find strategic space to accommodate China have made India stand in the Indo-Pacific far less convincing from time to time. A third set of issues is that even though there is a common, if unstated, recognition that China of the China problem, there are different areas of focus for different countries that could possibly drive these potential allies in different directions. For instance, the US, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand are far more focused on the Pacific and South China Sea, whereas India is more concerned about China's growing footprint in the Indian Ocean, rightly so. Therefore, one issue that needs to be resolved is to bring about a more effective Indo-Pacific strategy is to have a better coordination between these different sets of concerns, even though it all might, they all might be about China. Greater clarity could push way for certain amount of burden sharing, but I think, but I think that's uh, some distance away. Though every country does not have to get involved in every region, without some clarity, coordinated action and burden sharing are not going to be possible. So to identify some of these issues, I think there are going to be these coordination mechanisms as well as the capacity issues that need to be addressed and that needs to be built up in a sense. Let me just conclude. Um, I think, uh, yeah, the time. So given the overall Indian interest not to see a hegemon a dominating Asia, India has a unique opportunity to play a, determining, a determined role in shaping the uh, Indo-Pacific strategic order. India itself has argued for a multipolar non-hegemonic Asia and its growing economy could be could be could add to the capacities, but I think there are still capacity gaps that cannot be uh, that cannot maintain any balance in Asia on its own. It's also Asia is India is geographically too far away and does not have again sufficient capacity to project power in East and Southeast Asia. India's growth and emergence as a major strategic factor will force also China to adopt a more hardline policy, especially on political and strategic issues, which has been something that we have been seeing in the recent past. The consequence is likely to be increased competition, not only between China and India, but also across the Indo-Pacific. Continuation of such a trend will push India closer to the US and US allies such as Japan, Australia, and others who remain concerned about the strategic consequences of China's rise. But I think this could also give way for more formulations such as the Quad Plus, which is currently engaged in the COVID-19 context, but I think this could also gain greater strategic purpose in the post-COVID scenario. Um, I'll stop here and I think uh, hopefully I've uh, been within the time limits. Uh, thank you. And I look forward to any questions and comments uh, thereafter. Thank you. You've been well within the time limits. Absolutely. And once again, we've gotten yet another extraordinarily clear presentation, extraordinarily lucid, spelling out what India needs to do 
to play a more significant role in the Asia Pacific, especially as it seeks to counter China's growing presence uh, in the Asia Pacific and its increasingly not just assertive but aggressive behavior. But also, Dr. Uh, Rajagopalan's presentation underscores the hesitation of India to step forward, and more importantly, the lack of adequate capabilities um, to uh, address the kinds of challenges that it is con uh, confronting. And it is this issue of capabilities, I think that is especially important because the will can be mustered, but if you do not possess the requisite uh, sinews to carry out this strategy, and no amount of will will get you there. Uh, the, again, we have been blessed with a superb presentation. In fact, a series of extraordinary presentations this morning. And on that note, we will turn to Dr. Smruti Patnaik from uh, the Manohar Pat uh, uh, Parikar Inst uh, Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis in New Delhi. Uh, good evening to my fellow panelists from uh, India and good morning to you, uh, Sumitda. And it is great uh, to be part of this uh, panel. Uh, in fact, in between, uh, during the day, I was thinking I was not feeling well, so I was in double mind. But then the moment I felt well, I sent a message uh, to Pramod to tell him that, no, I will participate in this uh, particular panel where I'm going to speak. Uh, basically, what I have done is that my topic is global power transition and India, and this is uh, so, and power transition is not something new in international relations because it is not stat static in that sense. So all the time you see this uh, transition. The, so the thing is, uh, when you look at this power transition, you look at the India's role because here. We are not speaking of the India of the 1980s or you know the India of uh, 1947. We are speaking of India, uh, which in the past uh, you know one uh, more than a decade or so saw a very extensive economic growth. Where uh, you know this question, many of the Indians also thought perhaps the time has come for India to play a larger global role, which it had always uh, aspired. And uh, did not have the wherewithal uh, in that sense to go about, uh, you know, the kind of role which uh, its founding father, father had always uh, seen. Now, when when one look at this uh, global power, global power transition in India, I think uh, there are certain things one notice, and I think this is uh, very much uh, debated and discussed in many of the. Uh, academic forum, like for example, the relative decline of the United States, I would not say an absolute decline because uh, in any kind of uh, power transition, uh, it is not an absolute decline, it is very slow and one cannot, you know, even if one uh, speak of a downward a spiral of any particular power, but then again, uh, there, are, there are capacity of the state where, you know, it can come back. Uh, so. And the relative decline of the United States also see uh, how it has changed its engagement with different other powers. Like, for example, in this context, I would say the India-US relations, uh, the Quad and all probably will come, you know, when you have a relative decline. So you have a constellation of uh, countries which, in fact, put forward uh, the kind of uh, power uh, position which you want to take in the global affair. Second is the rise of China, uh, which one has seen very, very, uh, you know, impressive economic growth. And within Asia, one, one also is witnessing the rise of not just India, but Japan. And of course, uh, in the Indo-Pacific, you have Australia. And, and like, for example, few years back, many people had written off Russia, uh, you know, as a kind of country which can really make a contribution to the power transition or will become an assertive um, you know, country to which can play, um, uh, you know, play a major role. I think reassertion of Russia is also one is noticing. And all the, you know, all this while one see a lot of change in India's uh, traditional friendship with the uh, Russia on the one hand, you know, the former Soviet Union, and on the other hand, the newly, uh, you know, uh, a kind of relationship which it has developed with the United States post uh, uh, nuclear test. So here, when you look at this, there is this fear in India that 
you know, the Russia's own relationship with China uh, and also Russia's relationship with Pakistan is something which India is also closely watching. So in, in, in this kind of global power transition, what happens is that many of the countries are looking at um, multi-alignment. I, I really do not know where, whether one can use this term alignment, but I'm using it in a very loose sense in terms of uh, countries coming together and uh, not, you know, it is not the either or of the Cold War period, but you can have multi-alignment with depending on what your uh, priorities, national priorities are. So what does uh, power uh, transition means for India? So the question here is that, is there a power vacuum? I, I don't think so in that sense. Yes, a decline of a uh, you know, hegemonic power necessarily does not leave a kind of power vacuum uh, you know, where uh, only one country has this space. I think the power vacuum, uh, which uh, if I say that uh, you know, to some extent is there, it is Basically, you know, many other countries are vying for a kind of multipolarity. So it is not, you no know, more one is speaking of the unipolarity of the United States and its dominance on uh, various global institutions, especially the Bretton Woods system. But here you are also looking at other countries which are coming up in terms of, you know, in, due to the globalization, due to the new uh, power uh, constellation which one is uh, watching. So that also has an impact on global power, global power balance. So here, the choice is not like if one takes that China is emerging and the United States is declining. So again, I would say it's not the Cold War period where you have to choose either or because globalization does not give you uh, that kind of space to choose either or. And moreover, most of the countries are very much uh, intertwined in terms of the globalization, the trade, the market and everything. So that is not allow uh, in a sense you know to have a kind of uh, you know the people speak about new cold war but you are not going to have the same kind of configuration as one had uh, during the cold war period so on the one side as far as india is concerned you see in west asia there is uh, a transition in terms of india's own relationship with many of the countries in west asia uh, for example the united arab emirates with saudi arabia relationship has improved very, very significantly compared to the uh, to the past. And that could be also one of the reason in spite of, you know, Pakistan trying to get, uh, to activate the YC, it has not been successful. But also at the same time, in the Muslim world, you see Turkey is emerging as a kind of challenger in the, in the if one takes uh, the Muslim world kind of monol monolithic. So there is a uh, kind of competition between uh, various countries in West Asia. So the question here is that how does India look at West Asia? Uh, I would say that in terms of, of course, the energy uh, factor is there. Uh, the, I think what has now, uh, you know, has occupied the center space is the uh, counterterrorism kind of cooperation and, uh, you know, like the, the many of the people who are accused of uh, terrorism in India has been handed over by UAE and uh, Saudi Arabia because of India's own excellent relationship. Uh, of course, the US is withdrawing from the from West Asia. So you see China and Russia are emerging as uh, two major countries which, which are vying for influence. One has seen this in the context of Syria, what is happening. Russia's own relationship with Israel is also improving. And recently we saw UAE, uh, you know, is uh, uh, also uh, forging uh, ties, normal uh, diplomatic ties with Israel. So you have a kind of uh, power configuration which is coming where India is much more cautious about the kind of role, uh, you know, it, it can play. You know, it doesn't have that much of space like China and Russia, but it indeed has some space where it can uh, play a significant role. And what also affects India is, I would say, the Afghanistan-Pakistan region, and this is one of the very important reasons where the U.S. is, you know, uh, has is withdrawing. Uh, and one see, you know, the kind of violence, uh, you know, one is going to witness in this region is definitely going to have an impact. So, what does India do? So, there is this policy of whether, uh, you know, India can move into this space uh, in Afghanistan in terms of its linkages to the Central Asian countries and also, uh, you know, its, its ties with Iran in terms of Chabahar. But the recent uh, media reports, which was again uh, dismissed by India of losing out the railway project in uh, Iran, 
uh, who specifically uh, the Iranians said that they, you know, India was never part of that railway project. But nevertheless, I think uh, the slowness of uh, implementing some of the project, like for the north-south uh, transport corridor and all, uh, probably will provide India a greater connectivity to this region because unless until you have the physical connectivity, uh, geopolitics will not help because you have to have a kind of economic influence. Economically, of course, uh, due to globalization, you have massive infrastructure projects which, are, which is coming about. The BRI is there, uh, you know, which is going to really change the manner in which, uh, you know, the countries are going to uh, deal with each other. And also at the same time, globalization also has an, uh, you know, impact on the global governance. Now the question is, how does it impact India? You know, all these factors. I think uh, perhaps uh, India has been trying for a very long time to be part of the United Nations Security Council, which I, I don't think is coming now, unless until there is a reform which takes place. And given the factor that how India and China are dealing with each other. I don't think India, you know, China will ever be supportive of a reform process where it can bring in its rivals in Asia like Japan and India to the Security Council. Uh, similarly, in the, you know, in the, um, you know, NST, uh, again, uh, there is this uh, Chinese uh, challenge which has come about, which is saying that, you know, you formulate rules uh, how countries can be members so in, indirectly in, a, in in terms of uh, while it is pushing for a kind of yeah, it may appear that China is more interested in non building in terms of the admission of members to the NST but perhaps I think what it has in mind is uh, Pakistan's membership of the NST so there in, in, in terms of the global governance India cannot be a major player because of the institutional, you know, the structural impediment, which, uh, you know, which is there. Uh, so the question here is that, uh, like uh, Professor Ganguly was speaking about, uh, you know, this uh, India's own capacity building. I think we have been extremely reticent, uh, you know, in terms of our decision making. Like, for example, you know, if uh, Rajiv spoke about the Quad, and if you look at the Quad, you know, the decision uh, regarding going full place on the quad, you have seen the Malabar exercise uh, where, you know, Japan was invited only once, then, you know, there was uh, the second time they did not invite. So, you know, it is continuing. Of course, Australia was uh, also reluctant to get, uh, you know, to become part of quad. So I think perhaps somewhere we need to give a clear message. Uh, so all the time, uh, you know, weighing and counterweighing your, uh, you know, we, which is good in terms of the foreign policy, but some of the time the decision actually drags for too long and it is not very, very clear what exactly India wants in, wants in, term of, in terms of its uh, engagement uh, with the other emerging power and also, you know, how, how it is looking at the global power transition. So here, you know, the question comes, you know, like the United States has always said, if, you, if India wants to be a global power, that means it has to share responsibility. So that is where perhaps the capacity uh, of Indian state to take on the global responsibility comes about. But that is also where, you know, the norms, the institution also uh, comes about. Because unless and until there is institutional space to accommodate India, I really do not think India can play a very significant role. So the counter, uh, you know, a kind of um, a counter, counter institution in terms of, you know, the AIB, BRICS and all, uh, probably will will not proceed as much as it was expected given the current uh, India-China relationship. So therefore, I think India needs to be very vocal and clear about what exactly, you know, where does it figure in the power configuration and what is the kind of roadmap it has to play a larger global role. So I will end here and I look forward if there is any questions. Thank you very much, Smriti. Uh, this is a very important topic the question of power transition, the global, the global power transition and its impact on Asia and particularly India. And you've provided a detailed discussion of the reactions of various powers in Asia and especially India and have outlined uh, what India needs to do to maintain uh, or to boost its role in this time of a power transition. Now we will turn to the final presentation of this panel from uh, uh, Mr. Kin Muang So from the Myanmar Institute of Strategic and International Studies. 
The floor is yours, sir. Good evening, sir. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. And uh, I am really appreciate the initiative of the uh, Nepal Institute of International uh, Cooperation and Engagement and Water Policy Center for this uh, initiative. Uh, I'm going to speak on 27 word presentation topic of avoiding extension by promoting internationalism amid power transition and COVID-19, securing the stable, strong and strategic collaboration for the actualization of the 21st century as Asian century. The idea of my topics came from a couple of soft, uh, sources, including a recent book uh, by the professor Noam Chomsky, uh, uh, the international listen or extension. And my interaction with many uh, foreign friends from United States, China, India, Bangladesh, and some of ASEAN country, and my frequent visit to uh, China and India, my visit to China and India cover, my visit to uh, Tibet Autonomous Region, and the frequent visit to the Northeast India, especially the, 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 the Imphar, Manipur State. Uh, this opportunity uh, remind me of a word of wisdom of Mr. Desmond Tutu, uh, and he said, and I quote, don't raise your voice, improve your argument. The COVID-19 pandemic which started uh, with Wuhan, China in December 2019 is an alarming call to a war with 7.8 billion homo sapiens. The human war is full of controversy, conspiracy, and conflict because many people have uh, many differences in ideology, economics, uh, ethnicity, emotion, and education. The change is constant and inevitable with history, uh, different economy, and demographic of a nation in the world. If the world leaders fail to make right decision, the entire human planet will become extinct. It is very obvious that we are experiencing a power transition, which is a cyclical nature in nearly more than 300 year history of the nation state. According to Swedish professor AFK Organsky, a power transition is a transition in which it, a dominant global power is at least somewhat declining and a new global power is rising. During a power transition, risk of conflicts and even war can run high. History rise in history fall. History repeat itself. To see DD trap must be prevented from the further developing during and beyond COVID-19. Myanmar is a developing country, and but uh, Myanmar is uh, dedicated to be a part of solution to problem, but not a problem to the solution. Uh, Myanmar people are struggling to cope with mounting international pressure because of the big power rivalry and geopolitical competition. Myanmar cannot be, uh, uh, any small nation cannot be a, the, the, the power gained by any giant's uh, power near and far. Every sovereign state has right to exit without being discriminated unless it breaks international law. The Myanmar is determined to help America and China uh, uh, escape to CGD trap together with friendly nations who believe strongly in the principle of peaceful coexistence. Taking this opportunity of uh, the uh, various scholars from many countries, I would like to draw your attention to the story more about Myanmar growing geopolitical significance. The President Obama, the former US President Obama visited Myanmar in 2000 and he made a speech at famous Yangon University. I came here because of the importance of your country. You live at the crossroad of East and South Asia. You border the most populated nation on the planet. You have a history that reaches back thousands of years and the ability to help determine the destiny of the fastest growing region of the world. I am not exaggerating. Myanmar geopolitical significance amid power transition and COVID-19 is getting higher and higher. 
than President Obama, uh, what President Obama said in 2012. Myanmar had to intervene between the US and China in July 2020 after their, the media argument on their respective uh, embassy Facebook in Yangon. They exchanged blame on South China Sea and Hong Kong issue. Myanmar foreign ministry urged both China and the US to maintain good relationship uh, through exercising restraint. And for the sake of international peace and security, every nation is to promote internationalism. Uh, internationalism is the belief of real homo sapien, wise human being, that different country, different people, and different culture can achieve more advantages by working together and trying to understand each other than by arguing, finger pointing, and fighting war with each other because of extreme nationalism and ultra exceptionalism. We are to sing uh, things as they really are without injecting bias into any situation to navigate the complexity of international relations, which is under heavy influences of various conspiracy theory. The evidence-based and data-driven analysis reveal that Asian century is really entering amid COVID-19 pandemic and the sharp decline of U.S. liberal democracy. The professor Amita Acharya, a well-known scholar, uh, once he said, Trump is consequence, not the cause of the crisis and decline of liberal war order. Trump cannot uh, revive U.S. global hegemony, but he is more likely to destroy the U.S. bait and let war order than restore U.S. supremacy. Emerging power could be severed if they overcame China-India tension, China regional problem, and domestic weaknesses in others. Globalization is not dead, but is taking a new form. Let more by East and the West base more on South-South than North-South languages and focusing more on development than trade. It is going to be multiplex, not a unipolar or multipolar war. The Professor Amita Acharya is not only the one who trying to explain the problem with the U.S. The another U.S. Uh, dignity, Professor Joseph as Nye revealed his inconvenient truth about President Trump in his book entitled Globalization and its Discontent Revisited Anti-Globalization anti in the Era of Trump. The Donald J. Trump became President of the United States on January 20, 2017 and threw a hand grenade into the global economic order. The arrangement governing the movement of goods, services, and capital across border and attempting to ensure stability. The U.S. was pivotal in creation of this system in the aftermath of World War II. Partly because of this system, the second half of the 20th century was markedly different from the first half, which was marred by two World War and the Great Depression. The smoke has yet not clear, but the post-trend war will almost surely be different from what came before. One for three quarter of a century effort had forced on creating a more globally integrated war entailing global supply chain that has enormously lowered the cost of good. Trend reminded everyone, border do matters. History revealed that fall of empire or nation is mainly because of internal weaknesses, uh, external, sorry. Sorry, sir. The history review, the fall of empire or nation is mainly because of internal weaknesses than external pressure. The ubiquitous phrase of foreign policy is an extension of domestic policy can enlighten international relations practitioner, policy maker, and academician at any age of history. I repeat, foreign policy is an extension of domestic policy. 
The concept of 21st century as Asian century parallel the characterization of 19th century as Britain imperial century and the 20th century as the American century in which both the politics, politics and culture of United Kingdom and US dominated the rest of the world. The rest of the story of 19th century and 20th century is now part of the war history. History is alive and exciting. In 1942, the Mahatma Gandhi the, uh, uh, expressed his uh, vision, the potential of China and India. As a friend of China, I long for the day when a free China and free uh, India were cooperate together in friendship and brotherhood for their own good and for the good of Asia and the world. A 2011 study by the Asian Development Bank found that an additional 3 billion Asian could enjoy living standards similar to those in Europe today, and the region could account for over half of global output by the middle of this century. And it also stated that the Asian century is not preordained. The growing importance and emphasis of unity in Asia, as well as maturing and progressive relationship among country in the region, further solidifying the century creation of the 21st century as Asian century. Even in 1924, the scholar named Karl Hosfer used the term Pacific Age. He predicted the growth of Japan and China and India. To make a long story short, a country in East, South and South Asia desperately need to stand in solidarity and must not be divided by others who are becoming weaker and weaker domestically. Having said that, it doesn't necessarily mean that Asian country must be hostile to other countries, but we are to play a complementary role to make a better world for everyone. Asian century must empower the United Nations, which is of paramount importance for avoiding human extension because of great power, rivalry, and geopolitical competition. In my humble opinion, India deserves to join the United Nations as a permanent uh, security member with the Security Council to counterbalance China through soft balancing. Things are uh, indicating that post-pandemic war order will be made in Asia. Country in East, South, and Saudi Asia are forced to explore all possibility to secure and enhance the stable, strong, and strategic collaboration for the actualization of 21st century as Asian century. In conclusion, everything that irritates us about other can lead us to understanding of ourselves and people, organization, and nation don't have a real power unless they really empower others. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for a fascinating discussion on the possibilities and prospects of an Asian century. Uh, our panel uh, panelists have now formally come to a close. Uh, we will open the floor up to questions and comments Please use the chat function on your uh, uh, Zoom, uh, which is at the bottom of your panel, and you can send in a message either privately to me or to the entire group, and I will address your question in the order it was received. We have close to half an hour, and so we can make full use of our time. I am deeply grateful to this panel for a series of thoughtful and intriguing presentations. It is a pity that Ambassador Sajanar had a prior engagement and had to leave us, and we will not be able to engage him further, uh, but we have the rest of the panel with us, and I would, uh, oh, Ambassador Sajanar is back, so, we do have an opportunity to engage with him, and so feel free to ask him questions. You can direct questions either to the entire panel or to a specific member of the panel. And if you do the latter, please indicate whom you are directing this question to. The first question comes from the former director of the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, uh, my friend, 
uh, Mr. Shakti Sinha. And the question is, taking off from your reactions, meaning my reactions, to Prof. Dr. Rajagopalan's outstanding presentation, does she think that India would even be able to summon the will to help strengthen Taiwan's defense on the lines outlined by Dr. Nagal? So the question is for Dr. Rajagopalan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Gangli, and of course, uh, uh, Dr. Sh uh, Dr. Sinha. Uh, that's a terrific question, but I think uh, uh, precisely on the question of Taiwan, I think India did have an opportunity uh, to press a serious case, to make a strong case at the, at the uh, World Health Assembly. But again, India did not prefer to take a clear stand on that issue. And uh, it didn't come up to, of course, uh, voting on that on the subject. Uh, but India could have pushed and could have taken a proactive role in pushing for the pushing for the change uh, in the stature of uh, uh, WHO. But I think India did lose an opportunity uh, over there. And uh, I think this has been the part of the problem. India, even when it is presented with opportunities, now it, India is going to be part of the Security Council from next year onwards. Again, what kind of a role would India play? As well as uh, not just the Security Council, India also has an important role and I think to partner with other like-minded countries in reviewing and reforming the multilateral institutions because you don't want, like Ambassador Sajjan has said, you don't want a repeat of the pandemic to happen. Uh, so WHO was a clear case. The handling of the pandemic in the beginning of the crisis clearly showed the deficiencies of the multilateral functioning. It was hijacked by one single power. The leadership was beholden to one country. And therefore, the kind of misinformation campaign that it was uh, uh, engaged in, I think that was a serious uh, issue uh, which made the whole world suffer in this sense. So and uh, the other institution that comes to my mind again, uh, in particular reference to Taiwan is the ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization. And this is again linked very closely to the pandemic and the, uh, and the Taiwan issue, because even in the middle of the crisis, Taiwan was not getting adequate information on the kind of travel advisories and the kind of notification it should have been able to provide, it should have been able to receive in a sense. Uh, and this again linked to, uh, uh, like Ambassador pointed out earlier, the kind of number of people who were traveling out of Wuhan to the rest of the world and so on and so forth, the kind of coordination that happened between WHO, ICAO, and other important uh, power centers. So I think there are a, a, a lot of the in, in, in multilateral institutions need to be reviewed and reformed. And there has to be, especially for countries like Taiwan, it has to play. And given that Taiwan is one of the regional hubs when it comes to a lot of these issues, health-wise, again, uh, uh, again, the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic has shown the capacity that um, uh, it, uh, Taiwan has in terms of it, how it can, uh, it has effectively managed the issue, the kind of uh, the health expertise it has. And it had learned a great deal from the SARS uh, uh, health crisis in a sense in the past. And therefore, it was able to set up and put in place the capacities to deal with another major crisis of that kind. So it could have been a huge uh, um, uh, best practices that could have been shared by from Taiwan to the rest of the world in terms of how you go about um, uh, in managing the health crisis. But I think even otherwise, I think it's time for India to take a, a, a clearer stand. Taiwan has a greater role to play when it comes to the Indo-Pacific strategic uh, order. And I think we have to look at the critical role that it, Taiwan can play in that as well. Not just because usually we talk about Taiwan in the case when whenever you, there is an India-China tensions pick up, there's a potential conflict that is kind of happening. Then we talk about Taiwan, Tibet, and all of that as a, as a card. But I think instead of looking at Taiwan as a bargaining chip, as a card, we need to look at proactively pro, uh, promote uh, the role of Indo uh, Taiwan as a strategic partner in the Indo-Pacific uh, um, region, in a sense, as a, as, an area, as a country that can promote stability and prosperity in the region. Thank you very much for a comprehensive and thoughtful uh, response to uh, Shakti Sinha, Mr. Shakti Sinha's question. Um, once again, I wanted to remind everyone, we are delighted that Ambassador Sajjana is back. So he's certainly someone you can ask a question of or comment on his presentation. I noticed there's a question for me from uh, Mr. Uh, Kin Wang So from Myanmar. 
and it is about my view of the Asian century. Um, actually, the Asian century in considerable measure depends upon China's behavior. If it continues to behave in this extraordinarily aggressive fashion, it's going to fracture any possibility of Asian cooperation and any notion of Asian solidarity. For all its sweet words, its behavior has completely contradicted it's, um, uh, it has been contradicted by its actions. I am not a great votary of the Belt and Road Initiative, which I see mostly as a debt trap um, and could be potentially quite costly to a number of countries that in my judgment have foolishly embraced it and could find themselves in extraordinarily difficult circumstances. So I am somewhat skeptical about the possibilities of an Asian century, much as, as someone of Asian descent, I would like to see that happen. Uh, so thank the you, floor, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. And uh, the floor is open for questions and comments. So uh, we still have a good 25 minutes on hand. So please do take care, uh, do uh, uh, issue, uh, you know, step forward. Um, I see a question uh, from uh, uh, Utkarshama Amhajan. Uh, my question is for the entire panel. How do you see the China's digital Silicon Road Silk Road and Space uh, Silk Road can be balanced by other global powers. Uh, would anybody like to respond to that question? The floor is open to any of the panelists. And um, Ambassador Sajjanar has just asked the host to unmute him. So Pramod, would you please unmute Ambassador Sajjanar? I've just been unmuted, Professor Ganguly, and oh, if you- Wonderful. Yeah, if you permit, uh, I could take a yeah. shot at this question. Please. And also, if you permit, I could just add one sentence to you know, the very comprehensive response that was given by Professor Raji Rajgopalan to the other question on Taiwan. Yeah. Okay, so the first thing on uh, Taiwan, I think when the World Health Assembly met in uh, May this year, then the focus of the whole international community was to get a decision from the WHO about an independent impartial investigation into the origin of the pandemic or origin of the coronavirus. So in that sense, you know, this uh, resolution that came from the European Union, maybe it was not the best of resolutions. It was a highly watered down resolution but I think everyone wanted to get something off and they were very apprehensive, I guess, because of what China has been able to do on Hong Kong on the Uyghur issue, because you would remember that in Hong Kong, there were 22 countries which came up and said, uh, criticized, uh, went to the UN, uh, UN uh, uh, Secretary General, uh, General Assembly saying that, you know, what uh, China is doing there is against uh, international provisions. And China was able to bring in about uh, 37 countries which said, uh, you know, that whatever it is doing is uh, perfectly within its right. And something similar it was able to do in the case of the uh, treatment, uh, the so-called education centers or the concentration camps in uh, uh, Xinjiang in, uh, uh, as far as the Uyghurs are concerned. So I think the world was concerned whether China might again be able to marshal some of these uh, countries. And the focus was on getting that resolution. So it was thought that maybe Taiwan could be uh, postponed to later this year. So I guess it will come up at the end of the year. And the last comment there I would make is that, yes, I take it that uh, India could have been uh, more uh, proactive, more forthcoming. But I would take it uh, more as a failure of the international community to bring uh, Taiwan onto the, uh, uh, you know, the observer status of the World Health Assembly as it was before 2016, rather than a failure only of India. Because I think whatever we are doing right now, it has to be done in a concert of, let us say, either, you know, whether it is democracies, D10, or, you know, some of the other countries, 
coming together rather than individual countries taking a stand and trying to take it forward. We saw that uh, this move for an investigation came from uh, Australia, but then very quickly there was uh, a critical mass that got around it. So I think this is something going forward that uh, India, Japan, and all the other countries will really need to uh, look at and devise a strategy of their own in terms of going forward. Now, the question that has been uh, posed in terms of the uh, digital Silk Road and the space Silk Road, uh, I think uh, the uh, BRI projects uh, in very many parts of the world are under enormous stress. Uh, because of uh, shortage of uh, funding and uh, shortage of uh, resources. I know uh, I look very closely at uh, Central Asia, Southeast Asia, and I know that uh, many of those countries have gone to China and asking for a debt waiver. Many countries I know in, uh, uh, in Africa have gone to China and asked for a debt waiver because uh, things are not going too well as we've seen the economies on all the countries have come down. So I think if uh, uh, barring some of the very critical and crucial areas, like maybe through Kazakhstan, where uh, China might be willing to put in uh, uh, that money and that resources, I think the other areas, it might uh, have to wait for some more time for Chinese economy itself to get better. Because as we know, in the last uh, uh, People's uh, Congress, uh, earlier this year, China failed even to declare what its GDP growth is going to be. So the situation and the circumstances are very, very uncertain. Uh, and I don't think that uh, China will be able to muster all the resources to put in, in uh, these areas, while the uh, SREB, the Silk Road Economic Belt, and the Maritime Silk Road they themselves are uh, facing shortages of assets and resources. So in brief, this is, I think, definitely on paper, it is uh, something that China would like to take forward. But I think in practicality, it really might have to wait uh, for quite some time. Thank you. Thanks very much for a very thoughtful and sort of comprehensive response uh, to the question. Um, we'll uh, have to move on because there are other questions popping up in the chat uh, box. Uh, one of them is how likely is it that people will forget about China in 1921 after the COVID-19 and the US uh, election? Anyone want to take a crack at that? Yeah, I can. I can. Thanks, uh, yeah, absolutely. So. Absolutely. No, I think uh, this is uh, China is not uh, 2021. I don't think uh, we are going to be forgetting the impact of the uh, COVID-19 because the COVID-19 impact is going to stay with us for a very long time, whether it is in terms of economic, social uh, and political impact of the COVID is very, very significant uh, as you know, the, the whole crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic originated in China, but China has been able to, through whatever means, at least by going by some reports, have been able to limit the impact, but it has spread to the rest of the world and has created havoc in terms of every facet of our lives. So I don't think the COVID can be forgotten in another, uh, another come next year. I think we are going to be forgetting the impact of it because the impact is going to stay with us for everything. And, you know, starting from the economy, the difference, uh, given the uh, economic impact, I think countries are also looking at uh, 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 reducing their defense budget, for instance. And I think this is something that is going to uh, have a huge impact on the kind of uh, uh, Indo-Pacific Indo strategic order or anything that we want to talk about in this security and strategic side of things. Countries like India are already kind of slashing their defense budgets. Countries like South Korea already announced slashing their defense budget. So the economic impact is also going to be felt in the economic and in the, in the defense and strategic sectors. So that given this kind of impact, and at the same time, China has persisted with its aggressive behavior across the uh, uh, their neighborhood and even far away from their neighborhood. 
countries like uh, Canada have not been spared or Sweden. So it's not just the neighborhood using uh, uh, military, uh, using force, using military force, as well as economic and trade coercion, like countries like um, uh, Australia, which have been uh, bearing the brunt of that. Again, countries like New Zealand, each of these countries have been beginning, have been bearing the brunt of Chinese aggressive behavior. So I don't think, and their lack of now capacity, which has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, I doubt that people are going to be, or the countries or the leaders are going to be forgetting the impact uh, created by the COVID-19 pandemic, which originated in China. So I think these are issues that are going to stay in a sense with us for a very long time. And I think this is also going to complicate a lot many more uh, our equations with each other and so on and so forth. Uh, for instance, I think uh, one of the results of this is also going to be how countries in the region, in the Indo-Pacific region, will like to kind of relate to each other. And I believe that there are going to be uh, a, emerging, a set of emerging millilaterals in Asia, which are going to be useful in creating and revitalizing economic and strategic linkages. And I believe that the thicket of networks are going to come about, which are going to um, sort of strengthen some of the strategic engagements that are much required in this part of the world, uh, because China problem is not going to go away. Uh, even in the middle of the pandemic, they have been at it. Um, even, uh, even countries like, for instance, Indonesia, uh, which would have otherwise would not have preferred to take a very strong stand and so on and so forth. They have been harassed and the number of naval intrusions have, have been um, so many since January onwards. Countries like uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, Malaysia, Philippines, and of course, Taiwan and uh, Japan and now uh, India in the sense. So I think uh, the Chinese aggressive behavior has been such that I think it's very difficult to forget how it has kind of contributed to the current state of the affairs, but at the same time, it has also contributed to our uh, sort of reduced capacity to deal with the, uh, because of the COVID impact and so on and so forth. So I think issues are somewhat interlinked and I think they're very difficult to um, separate out, but I think the impact, uh, uh, nobody is going to forget that COVID-19 has changed the lives of people in more ways than one and this affected practically the whole world. Professor Ganguly, could I come in for a, just two uh, sentences, please? Yes, please. Uh, uh, because I fully second what uh, Professor uh, Rajgopalan has said. And uh, I guess this question is born out of the fact, you know, and people say that uh, the memory of the public is proverbially short. So, you know, once the pandemic is gone, then everything is forgotten. And uh, the uh, China has all the wherewithals to sort of, you know, reach out to the countries. But I think, in my view, uh, this time China did have a great opportunity to reach out to different countries, notwithstanding the mistakes that it made right at the beginning of the pandemic in uh, uh, November, December, January. If it was more empathetic, if it was more kind, if it was more generous, if it was more considerate to reach out to these countries. But uh, China has taken exactly the opposite uh, tack. Uh, maybe it is because of its own domestic uh, uh, compulsions that it has been forced to do that because Mr. Xi Jinping wants to show that he is a muscular, he is a very uh, strong uh, figure as far as uh, the world is concerned. And even when there has been so much of a pushback, so much of a backlash against it, you see what uh, Wangi has been saying in uh, Norway, that if uh, any Hong Kong democracy uh, activist is uh, given a Nobel Prize, it will be seen as something against the country. So I, I don't know, they don't seem to be learning their lessons. So in that sense, yes, I don't think it is going anywhere. It is definitely going to, you know, China is doing its best to rub it in, in the minds and consciousness of the people. And the second part was in terms of the US election, uh, whether there's something going to change. Now, I feel if Mr. Trump is going to come, there is uh, more of the same. But if uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris were to come, then maybe there might be a change in style and uh, less uh, a change in content. But you being there, I think you would be much better placed than any one of us to <laughs> comment on that. But this is my two pence worth uh, that, uh, you know, I feel uh, that uh, uh, there is a... Uh, uh, bipartisan consensus, uh, not only amongst the political parties, but business, media, academics, think tanks, etc., across the board, that uh, China this time has really, in a variety of ways, 
you know, crossed uh, many red lines. And uh, so uh, the United States needs to push back against it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just on the US election, one sentence, and that one sentence is the following, that not only will there be a stylistic change, but I suspect a, a substantive shift if uh, Biden and Kamala Harris uh, come to office, but that's a subject of another separate conversation. I noticed that there are already three or four more questions, so we will move promptly to those. One of them is very specifically directed to Dr. Patnaik, and which is a, a counterpoint to what we've been talking about China, and someone suggests that given uh, the pervasive China bashing across the world, um, uh, 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 can we trust media reporting on, on China? Yeah, that is true, but I don't think uh, some of the reports which has been coming about everywhere is not uh, something which is not based on uh, certain facts. And I think, uh, you know, most of this report which is coming about on China uh, on, the, on the COVID-19 and whether China is responsible and to what extent China is responsible uh, as far as the spread of COVID-19 to other European countries and to Asia is concerned. But I think in the context of the border, uh, you know, the India-China conflict which is going on, uh, perhaps adds to that kind of, uh, you know, the irresponsibility, quote unquote, of China in the time of the COVID-19, you know, the, this kind of incursion uh, taking place across uh, in Ladakh is, is something which has brought a lot of criticism within uh, India uh, itself. And second, of course, as Professor Ganguly was also speaking about the BRI and the kind of debt trap, uh, you know, this is leading to also brings in the criticism. So one has to look into what are the factors which is actually driving, uh, you know, this criticism against uh, China. So I, I would say that, you know, these are very, very clear cut, the COVID-19, the failure of China to, you know, to inform uh, everybody, the kind of, uh, you know, epidemic uh, which was uh, present in Wuhan at that much time, uh, allowing the flight to take off from Wuhan, whereas, you know, in, internally the flight was almost uh, stopping at that point of time. And, uh, of course, this entire debate about the BRI and all, uh, so therefore it's not about that the press is writing, uh, you know, criticism about China without any kind of basis. Definitely, there is a basis, but one can debate about whether some of the, uh, you know, some of the reports are exaggerated and are not, uh, you know, actually making uh, a lot more than what exactly is happening. I, I think some of the reports are justified in in in, in particular context. Just... Okay, um, we have about seven more minutes, and there's a question again from Shakti Sinha about. Um, uh, how much uh, can we expect a post Abe Japan to be committed to raising Japan's profile internationally and in the region? Abe was able to push India, for example. Can his successor do that? I think this should properly go to Dr. Nagao. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, in this question, the uh, yeah, uh, influence of the Prime Minister Abe is very important because he was the pioneer of the Indo-Pacific concept and the quadrilateral cooperation. Repeatedly, he emphasized this idea and finally passed away the United States and the United States started to use this concept. So without him, who can explain this strategy? That is a very important factor. But the, at the same time, this kind of the strategy not consisted by only one person. The bureaucratic process, through the bureaucratic process, Japanese government uh, materialized this concept. So that is the reason the Japanese next prime minister tried to continue. In this means, steadily, the relation between the Japan and other Indo-Pacific countries, including India, will develop. But uh, uh, emotionally, Prime Minister Abe is something special. He is relative of the Indian. His cousin had married with Indian lady. And uh, because of the, he is uh, quite nationalist, 
the, and the India supports such kind of the mindset of him for a long time. That is the reason uh, his emotion toward India is a little special compared with other Japanese. And uh, so if the, he resigned from the prime minister, the, both the Indian side Japanese or India lost a good supporter. So that is true. But in my opinion, he has come back in 2012 after he resigned in 2007. After he recovered from this year, he will come back, I believe. That is the reason his Indo-Pacific concept or his quadrilateral security diamond will come back again. That is my opinion. Answer, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one final question. And this is a question about India's neighborhood policy. Would anyone on the panel care to comment on it? Particularly those from India. Okay, can I take it on, Sumita? Sure, but be very brief because time is extremely limited. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, in terms of India's neighborhood policy, India has moved from a very security-centric approach uh, as defined by various treaties which India signed in the 1950s, uh, the peace treaty with uh, Bangladesh and those kind of things. Uh, so I would say that we have moved from a security-centric approach to a much more economic uh, kind of approach, uh, where we are not looking at the border as, you know, def defining India's security, but we are looking at border as a kind of opportunity which needs to be crossed in terms of uh, trade and connectivity. Uh, so that I, I would say that is a major transition in, you know, in India's thinking over the period of time uh, to, you know, its uh, uh, outlook towards the neighborhood. If that, this is the short answer I can give. Can I just add a two, two finger comment? Something? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I agree with, the, I just want to add on to something that uh, Smriti has already uh, touched and uh, talked about. But I think we have made a lot of messes uh, in, the, in our neighborhood, we, whether it is Nepal, whether you could blame it on structural issues and so on and so forth. Uh, there are serious problems. But India being the big neighbor should be more magnanimous with its neighbors, whether it is Bangladesh. And some of the problems are self-created. We have created the foreign policy uh, challenges for ourselves. Bangladesh, the way in which we went about some of the domestic issues without being considerate to some of our neighborhood, how that's going to be affected, played out. I think that's been our own making in a sense. Uh, Nepal, Sri Lanka again is... Uh, is falling into the uh, Ch China's uh, corner in a sense. Uh, again, what did we do? Um, uh, and I think here is the key question, which is also ties up with the, for instance, the larger question about the BRI. With BRI, you can talk about the debt trap diplomacy issue and so on and so forth. But at the same time, what are the other Indo-Pacific countries doing in order to uh, provide assistance uh, in any which way to these countries. So unless we are able to provide uh, either connectivity projects or other kind of assistance to these countries, these countries will keep going back to ch um, China. Sri Lanka, in the second year of the debt trap uh, issue, when they had to re uh, come up for the, uh, there were the Sri Lanka, it came for this second installment of the uh, repayment. They went back to China asking for a fresh lease of money. So. What happened to all the Indo-Pacific powers that we that could have played a bigger role, whether it is the US, India, India being an immediate, immediate neighbor, South Asian major power, we didn't do anything about it. So our own neighborhood, we have to be more generous because these are all smaller neighbors. We have to be generous. We have to be magnanimous in dealing with them. Uh, recently, Dr. Jayashankar talked about how, how there, are, there are other politics. Sure, China is trying to take advantage of that situation, but the fact is that we have provided as sort of an opening for China to come in and kind of play a bigger role. China is able to play that bigger role because of us, our own misdemeanors. Just Thank two comments, very, Professor Ganguly, on yeah, this. Please. Very allow quick, me to. Because we are literally out of time. Yeah, but allow me to, because, you know, give a little bit of balance, because, you know, not going into theoretical or IR theory, but on empirical basis. You know, I think as far as Bangladesh is concerned, there are so many new initiatives that have been taken in terms of connecting the Northeast with Chittagong. And I think our partnership is really growing. So I know that uh, uh, more is possible, but as far as Bangladesh is concerned, our relations, if you were to look at it today from what it was five or six years ago, I think it is much better. As far as Sri Lanka is concerned, the new foreign secretary has just said 
that India first is uh, in strategic terms our policy which we are following and uh, that Hamman Tota was a mistake. I think we need to build upon that. As far as Maldives is concerned, again, we have uh, been able to do uh, considerably well. So I think there are uh, criticisms because people would like to see much more happening. But where we are today, I think we are at a reasonably decent spot uh, as, as things go. So let me, let me finish here. Nepal, again, we saw the Prime Minister of Nepal calling our Prime Minister on 15th August. So I think there are possibilities of taking this relationship forward. And uh, India will take cognizance of what has just happened uh, in uh, the recent past on Nepal, Bangladesh, when it uh, uh, formulates its policies going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much for that intervention. I'm afraid I have to bring the proceedings to a close, even though there are questions. I am deeply grateful to uh, uh, Dr. Pramod Jaiswal and to the Water Policy Center for organizing this session and the entire conference. This is a marvelous intellectual effort and a substantial effort involving people literally across the globe at various in various time zones for which I am deeply grateful to the panel. And on that note, I will turn the proceedings back to Dr. Jaiswal for a final word. And I'm afraid I have to leave. Thanks, Sumit. Thank you for staying up. <laughs> yeah, so let's move to the vote of thanks. And so, yeah, let's start. Yeah. So our distinguished chairs, speakers, ladies and gentlemen, as we come to the end of the session, it is my great honor to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of NICE and WPC. I would like to express uh, gratitude and sincere thanks to Prof Professor Sumit Ganguly for accepting our request to chair the session. Our sincere thanks goes to all speakers for delivering such a comprehensive and insightful presentation. We are honored to have all the speakers with us here today. We would like to acknowledge our gratitude to our friends from the diplomatic community, experts, academia, media, and different organizations. Last but not the least, I must mention our deep sense of appreciation for our audience who, have, who has participated in the webinar and those who are watching us live. We are truly honored to have you all with us this morning, uh, evening, and hope to stay connected with you in future as well. I request all of you kindly, uh, yeah, just 